All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 17. And I want to share with you for a few moments today. I told you we might go over 1130 if you have a, a football to watch or maybe you have lunch to get to because you're not fast. See, if you rush out for lunch, we know you're not on the fasting threat, okay? <laughs> All right. But there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. All right. All right. So uh, let's go. Uh, Genesis 17. Now, what I want to talk to you about today for a few moments, we talked about this last night, but I'm going to come at it from a different angle. And that is God's desire for you to increase. God is a God of increase. It is his nature to want to see you increase and to be blessed. Sometimes blessing gets a bad rap because if we say it enough and too many times, it sounds like we're prosperity preaching. The only indictment against prosperity preaching is that it's the only thing being discussed. Otherwise, prosperity preaching means you're, you're telling people that God wants to prosper you. If that makes you a prosperity preacher, then we should all be prosperity preachers. The problem with the prosperity gospel alone is that there's no suffering, there's no death, there's no anything else going on, and there's a balance in our lives between the two. Paul said, I have to die daily. I crucify my flesh. I beat it. It's stubborn like a mule. I got to bring it into subjection. And at the same time, God wants to radically bless you. The, the biggest thing that blocks us from the blessings of God in our lives are us. It's not even the devil. The devil was defeated on the cross. We have dominion over sin in our lives. And yet, when we let ourselves limit God and block God and get in the way, I told you last night, and I won't rehash the verse because you got to go watch it. Hebrews 11, 6 says this, without faith, it's impossible to be pleasing to God. And so what does it tell us, though, in the same text, in the same verse, it tells us what faith is. Faith is two parts. First, it is, I have to believe that he's able. Second of all, I have to believe that he's willing. Because many people believe, they don't even question whether God is able. Of course, God, you're able. You can do anything you want to do. Where they, where they question in their heart subconsciously is that he's willing to do it for you. God is a rewarder. We have to believe that he is a rewarder. Faith without expectation of reward is not faith. It's incomplete. It's impartial. So you will not see the increase of God in your life in the areas that you, you want to see as long as you leave it up to, well, if God wants to do it, he'll do it. I have to partner with God and say, God, you said in your word you want to increase me. Now, upon what, what covenant, upon what basis is that increase a guarantee in the life of the believer? I'm willing to boldly stand up here today and say to you that increase is a guaranteed promise that he's given you. Now, whether you claim it today, you have access to this covenant through Christ Jesus, but we appropriate the covenant through faith. Right? So let's look. 17 in Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me. I'm reading in the Amplified and be blameless and complete. Okay. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. How many of you would love to multiply exceedingly this year? How many of you would love to multiply exceedingly in the health of your body this year? How many of you would love to multiply exceedingly in your finances this year? How many of you would love to multiply exceedingly in the number of souls you see brought into the kingdom through your lives this year? How many of you would like to multiply exceedingly in the number of people you see healed under your ministry this year? Wait, wait, pastor, under my ministry, I don't have a ministry. Yes, you do. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, you have a ministry. It's called being a disciple and making disciples. He said, go heal the sick, cast out devils, right? Speak in new tongues. These are things that we do. These are signs. These signs follow them that believe. Do you know, though, there's many places where there are unbelieving believers, Oh, Lord, I believe. But if none of the signs that Jesus said would follow our lives, what it means is we're really not in alignment with what we claim we believe. Because we believe he's able, he's able to heal. But that whether he will or whether he won't, I'm not so sure about. And yet God established that willingness in his word. So here we see he promises to do what? Now, who established the covenant? In verse 2, I, meaning God Almighty, will establish my covenant between me and you. So this is God. Now remember, in Genesis 15, to contextualize this, God has a conversation with Abram. 
And that conversation goes something like this. Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Your what? Your reward shall be very great. Your reward. Abram says, Lord God, what reward will you give me? So right there, I want to I break that mindset that we have that to expect God to reward us is selfish. There's something wrong with us. We're doing it. What's your motive? If you're looking to get something from God, that's the wrong motive. No, that's a lie from the pit of hell. I fully expect and believe and am anticipating with hope and excitement the reward that God wants to place into my life. Where I'm not looking for reward is from men. If I fast, if I give, if I pray to be seen or rewarded or praised by men, then I have my reward already. And the reward is whatever they said. Great job. That's it? That's all I get? If my motive was to be seen, that's all I get. I hope that was worth it. What Jesus said is when you do these things and you do them in such a way that your motive is to be pleasing to God and you look to him to your reward, then your reward comes from him. And here's how good God is about rewarding. Not only will he reward you, but he will reward what you did in secret in front of nobody. He's going to reward you in front of everybody. He will give you out in the open the reward. See, he doesn't say, I'm going to reward you privately and quietly. He says, not only will I reward you, but I'm going to reward you so everybody can see the reward, the favor, the blessing on your life. So, so Abraham has a conversation with God and says, God, what are you going to give me? How are you going to reward me? Now, he was dealing specifically with the covenant promise of a son. He was believing for that. And of course, he thought Ishmael was it. And God said, no, that's not it. Isaac is what I have for you. Okay. Now, go to verse uh, 6. Okay, uh, in 17, Genesis 17, 6. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Wow. Who is the one that makes us exceedingly fruitful? God. We studied last night in Corinthians. Okay. Paul says, one man sows, one waters, but it is God that brings the increase. I am responsible for sowing and watering. God is responsible for the increase. All you have to do is trust him to sow and to water and to be faithful. If you're generous in sowing and watering, then you will reap generously. If you're sparing, you'll reap sparingly. Okay? We should not put more faith in natural laws of putting a seed in the ground. How many of you have ever sowed seed of some kind? Right? Maybe in your yard, maybe plants, whatever. Okay? Did, were, you, were you fearful that you were going to waste the seed and lose the value of that seed? What was the real value of that seed? Meaning, how much did the seed really cost you in your life in comparison to the thing that was going to grow from the seed you planted? And so we don't go planting in our natural gardens. We're not, you're not worried about letting go of seed. Because seed to you is a small thing. It's a minor thing. Yet when it comes to our seed in our lives, it becomes a big thing. And all of a sudden we're scared to let it go because what if it doesn't produce? See, that's the place of unbelief. That's not faith. Faith is I expect God to reward my prayer, my fasting, my sowing, my serving. I believe this year God wants to make you exceedingly fruitful. Now let's keep going. Let's look at Genesis twenty-two fifteen. 15. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, by myself, I have sworn. Who? By whom? By myself, meaning by his self, he swore. And at the same time, by himself. He's all alone in this. This isn't contingent on Abraham here. The law was contingent on, on the obedience of the Israelites and doing the law. And if they violated the law, they were guilty. This covenant, God put Abraham asleep in, in the earlier chapters and passed a flaming torch between them and made a covenant. Now, he swore by himself. He sealed and signed this covenant in his name by himself. And then what he says is, watch, I have sworn... That since you have done this thing and not withheld from me your only son, indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your descendants. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. 
Through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, I want you to see something here. Two things are under the covenant for us of Abraham and Christ. The first thing is our blessing. The second thing is we become a blessing. Your seed not only will be blessed and multiply and increase exceedingly, but your seed will be a blessing. And because of your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Do you know you carry the ability to bless the nations? To be a blessing to God, to be a blessing to people's life? You ought to be overflowing with the reality of what's already yours. Now, I'm not talking about something you got to go earn in 2023. I'm teaching you theologically something you already have and you have access to every day when you walk in it by faith. Let's go see what we're talking about now. Where does it tell us? So, yeah, that's great. That's awesome. That was to Abraham and his descendants and his seed. But I'm a Gentile. I live in Texas and in Farmersville of all places. Can anything good come out of Farmersville, Lord? Right? Do you even know where Farmersville is, Jesus? Okay? Right? So let's go see what the Lord says about that. Galatians 13. I think Farmersville he mentions in Galatians. Okay? No, I'm kidding. Okay? So let's take a look at Galatians 13 now. Now you better hang on to this. You better grab a hold of this today. Okay, 13, uh, I say 13, sorry, 313 and 14, okay? Christ purchased our freedom. Yeah, Galatians 13, that's where Farmersville mentions, okay? <laughs> Galatians 313 and 14, Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law. So he purchased our freedom, he redeemed me from the curse of the law and its condemnation because he became the curse for me. This was the finished work. This is the purpose of Christ being manifested on the earth. 1 John 3, 8 tells us the reason Christ came was to destroy, to loosen, to dissolve the works of the devil. One of those works was condemning me against the law. The law does not stand to justify me. The law is condemnation to me because the law is holy and righteous and just. Is there any sin in it? Absolutely not. But does it have any mercy? The law is not mercy. The law brings condemnation. The Bible says in 1 John that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here we see Christ became a curse for me. He hung on a tree for what? To, to, to loosen and to dissolve and to break the power of the curse over my life. There is no curse now operating on my life, but only blessing. Now what? In order that what though? What was the purpose? What, what was the end result of Christ going to the cross? Here's what it says, verse 14. In order that in Christ, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. So there it is. Now I can connect my heritage. I am now the seed of Abraham in Christ Jesus. And now the blessing that was on the man 4,000 plus years ago, do you, do you think Abraham earned it? How does the Bible tell us over and over again in Romans and Hebrews that Abraham received? It was accredited to him as righteousness through faith, through believing what God said. Even when God said, take now thy only son, the Bible tells us in the New Testament in Hebrews, we understand the thought process that Abraham was going under at the time. And that was all we hear is the story in Genesis and Hebrews. It tells us Abraham considered Isaac as good as dead. And for three days, he was in that state. And yet Abraham believed that God could raise him from the dead because this was the covenant son. Now, God had said through your seed, through Isaac and then others, through your seed, I'm going to bless the nations and I'm going to multiply exceedingly. And yet here he gave him the promise and it said, put it on the altar. Right? Abraham believed God. It was accredited to him. So how do we receive today? You have received, if you're a Christian, you have received salvation. But many Christians stop there. And they never walk in the fullness of the blessing that God has for their life because they forget that they are under the covenant of the eternal promise of God. Let's, let's take a look at Hebrews 13. Or excuse me, uh, Hebrews uh, 7, uh, 6. <laughs> That's what fasting will do for you, okay? All right. Hebrews uh, 6, sorry, uh, 13. I'm giving you every verse as a chapter today. <laughs> All right. For when God made the promise to Abraham, he swore an oath by himself since he had no one greater to swear by, saying, 
I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. So the same covenant now he gave Abraham, we just saw that is yours in Christ, okay? And so having patiently waited, he realized the promise Now, that was the promise of Isaac. Indeed, men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them the oath serves as a confirmation and is the end of the dispute. So when a man gives an oath to another man, we don't value that as much in our culture today, but I'll tell you today, oaths still matter in the spiritual realm. And very much in ancient culture, oaths were your seal and your promise. It was done. It was locked. Okay. Now, in the same way, God, in his desire, this is verse 17, Hebrews 6, 17, in his desire to show to the heirs of the promise, notice that's plural, that's you, you're the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable nature of his purpose intervened and guaranteed it with an oath. So we don't have a man's oath on this covenant. I have the oath of Yahweh, the oath of the almighty God, the master of the universe, okay? So that by two unchangeable things, that is his promise and his oath, in which it was impossible for God to lie. Remember, the Bible tells us nothing is impossible with God, and yet it is not possible for him to lie. He cannot prove false. Do you know why God can't prove false? Because even if a thing was not, when he speaks it, it becomes There was no light, and God said, let there be light. See, if I said, let there be light, I'd be a liar, because there's no light. When God speaks a thing, it becomes a thing. God cannot lie. Every word out of his mouth is truth, and it's life, and it's living, and it's powerful, and it's cutting through the bone, and the marrow, and the sinew, and the tissue in our lives. It's cutting through soul and spirit, dividing between them, sifting the motives of our heart. His word, when he speaks a word, now he spoke this word over you. And that word is that I have made a covenant with you. I have given you my oath and my promise, and I cannot lie. I cannot violate my word. He even says in the Psalms that he's he's exalted his word even above his name. That's how important it is that you believe God. When we have unbelief, it's sin. Romans 14, 23 says, anything that doesn't proceed forth from faith is sin. Because if I don't take God at his word, imagine the egregious nature of the sin. See, we don't even realize unbelief and doubt are so egregious. But in essence, what we're saying is, God, I don't take you at your word. Right? This hope, verse 19, is the anchor of the soul. This hope. So what hope? The hope of the eternal covenant promises of God. Do you know he told Abraham that this covenant I've established as a statute forever and ever and ever? Do you know that the Bible teaches us in Hebrews? Go read Hebrews. Go read Romans. Do you know what it says? It tells us that we have a new and better and greater covenant and dispensation now in Christ Jesus. It says if the one that was delivered to us in the old came with great glory, how much greater the one that was delivered through the son of grace and mercy and truth. So we have this covenant, which means what I'm saying to you today is you have a covenant promise that everything you put your hands to will prosper. Everything that you do will increase. Why is it that Jews just seem to increase and just seem to prosper in just about everything they do? Do you know Jews, many Jews, okay, aren't Messianic Jews. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. If they're in Judaism, they're they're lost. Paul deals with that and addresses that in Romans. And yet they are the covenant people of God. God brought through Israel all the, the fathers, the blessing, the law, the prophets, and even his son. And yet through his son, the mystery came, that Paul came to deliver to the rest of the world was that through Jesus, God has even made the way for the Gentiles. And, Paul, and, and, and God says, don't, don't come into it now with arrogance and attitude. Come into it with fear and trembling. Because if God grafted out the natural plant, how much more the wild one? Okay? So we live in a place where we recognize the grace and the value of God. We don't discount Israel. Israel is the covenant people of God. And yet Jesus tells us just because you were a seed by the natural doesn't mean you're a seed in the spiritual. 
Paul said, I'm a spiritual Israelite indeed if I have faith in this covenant through Yeshua's blood. And that means now that everything, see, Jews, why, why do Jews prosper? Because God declared something over them and they grow up believing it, teaching it, talking about it, practicing it, living it, expecting it in everything they do. They don't even know Jesus. And yet they prosper. Why? Because the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob said, I'm going to prosper you. And, and tell your sons and your daughters about it. Write it on your foreheads. Put it on your doorpost. Everywhere you go, in the morning when you rise up, talk about the blessing. Talk about my covenant. When you go to bed at night, talk about the covenant and my blessing. So they are expecting the covenant to find them everywhere they go. And, and us as believers, we have a greater dispensation and a greater covenant and a greater blessing and yet so many of us leave on the table the grandness of God because we limit him by thinking that he's able and yet maybe not as willing for me. He's no respecter of persons. You know the verses, but do you believe that? Do you recognize that? Let's look at Romans. We're almost done. I'm not even going to quote the verse in the chapter until I get there myself this time. Okay. <laughs> oh. Hallelujah. Okay, Romans 4, 16. I feel confident I've secured the verse for you. Okay. <laughs> Therefore, here we go. Now, this promise that you have, remember, I showed you in Galatians 3. This promise is yours. 3, 3 and 13 and 14. This promise is yours. It's a covenant through what? Through Jesus Christ. Now, let's read Romans 4, 4 16. Therefore, the promise... We're dealing with the same thing. Paul's addressing the same promise. Depends entirely on what? Faith. Faith. Show me there what part of this promise depends on your ability, your sufficiency, your works, anything. Okay? Watch. In order that it may be given as an act of grace. Now, let me say this to you. God, God gave me this revelation years ago. I've shared it with people. It's in his word. It's not new. We got to return to the ancient paths. We shouldn't try to be creative and come up with some fresh message that doesn't exist somewhere, but we're going to the word. We're finding the word. We're extrapolating the word. What does it say? It says the promise depends entirely on faith. What is faith? Taking God at his word and receiving the appropriation of what he purchased for me through the finished work of Christ. And it says, so that it may be given as an act of grace. So how do I walk in the covenant in the same way you walked in salvation when you first believed? See, we start out in grace. We start out by just simply believing. Did, you, did, you, did your life change overnight when you accepted Jesus Christ? Did everything transform and you saw, saw the world change on its axis for you when you got saved? Or did you believe in your heart and confess Jesus with your mouth and you were saved? The evidence of your salvation follows the belief in your salvation. In the same way, the covenant promises of God are mine and I appropriate them and I grab them and I receive them and I thank God for them by faith. And as soon as I begin to recognize that by faith I live under this covenant, then all of a sudden the evidence of me living under the covenant begins to follow my belief. I will not see what I'm not expecting in my life. God is going to give you, I said this last night, God's going to give you bread for eating. Don't worry. He, his seed will not be out begging for bread or the righteous forsaken. What I'm talking to you about is the overflow. What I'm talking about is that abundant life that Jesus said, I came to give you life and that what? Abundantly. Paul said, above all that you can ask or think, right? This is the kind of life. Now, it is appropriated by grace, guaranteed, watch this, so that the promise will be what? Guaranteed. Guaranteed. That means it, it can't fail. Have you ever had a money-back guarantee or a warranty of some kind that you felt confident? You're like, okay, I got 90 days to return this thing. I got a money-back guarantee if I don't like it. How many people ever returned that item, by the way, on a money-back guarantee? I don't know. I don't know that I ever have, okay, even if it was terrible. Okay, having said that, 
we get guarantees from people, knowing people let us down, knowing people lie to us, having experiences that contradict guarantees, and yet we take people at their guarantee. How much more can we take the God of heaven and earth at his guarantee? Do you know that, that not only does he give you the promise, but here's what he does. He goes a step further because he knows it's not just enough for you that, that he tells you, but here's what he did. He gave you a sign of the guarantee. Do you know what that sign is? It's the person of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he is the guarantee on your inheritance. He is the seal on your inheritance. So God says, I'm giving you my one and only son whom I love to be the propitiation, the perfect sacrifice for your sins, to destroy and loosen and dissolve the works of the devil in your life. And then the Lord came and he said, oh, by the way, I'm leaving. I'm bouncing. I'm getting out of here. And they were like, wait, what do you, wait, what do you mean you're leaving? And he said, no, this is a good thing for you. I'm sure at the moment it didn't feel great. Yet he said, it's good. Why? Because when I leave, I'm going to give you the comforter, the one who's been with me my entire ministry. And when I do, God is going to seal you with him as a signet ring of a king, signing a letter and promising his guarantee. He's putting a down payment on your eternal inheritance and guaranteeing you the promise that he cannot lie and he will not violate his promise. And now you are a covenant son and a covenant daughter. And what I want to challenge you this year in 2023, every week, every day, every month, this year, begin to say to God, God, I'm looking for your favor in what I do. I'm expecting your blessing in what I do, not because of my merit, but because of Christ. You have to begin, and I'm closing with this. You must begin, uh, Romans 4, 16. You got to begin to expect to see in your life what Jesus purchased on his merit, not on your merit. As long as you're doing it according to your resume and your merit and your ability and your hard work and your striving, we're always striving, we're striving. Do you know striving was part of the curse? Now, I don't mean we don't work hard. We don't discipline ourselves. We don't show up faithfully. We don't, we don't do those things. The Bible teaches that. What I'm saying is in a spiritual sense, I'm no longer striving anymore. Striving is part of the curse. There is no sweat in the presence of God. He even told the priest, don't even put on wool and come in my presence. Because if you sweat, it's going to be unacceptable. I'm not receiving your sweat. There will be no sweat of your brow that gets you where you want to go. Because I am the Lord God. And no flesh will glory in my presence. God will never, ever, ever let his glory ever be challenged by flesh. And if you get it, you earn it all yourself, guess what? It's going to be small at the end of it all compared to what God has for you and what he wants to give you. So begin this year in your life to say, okay, God, I'm believing you based on the merit of Jesus to reward me. Based on his goodness, his merit, his perfectness, not my perfectness, his perfectness. I'm trusting you to reward me in every area of my life. I'm going to honor your word. I'm going to obey your word. But God, I thank you that I live in this covenant ratified through the blood. And now everything that God promised Jesus is ours. Let me give an example. God, he says in Ephesians, we have all spiritual blessings in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. He goes on to say that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. Do you know right now you're seated in heavenly places? So why are you being so earthly minded in the way you go about your faith and your expectation of God's reward? Why are we being so small?